illusion in your life. Now generally we think that illusion is a negative thing. But let's just consider the point of view that perhaps everyone needs a bit of illusion in their life just to keep them going from day to day. A little, shall we say, creative self-deception <laughs> or positive illusion. It may be that we're not such fans of reality as we think we are. It could very well be that we don't really want to know the facts. <laughs> Why? The ancient yoga texts explain that there's such a thing as attachment. Because of our mental and physical attachments, going back over many births, many lifetimes. We have various complexities, various barriers that have solidified. And so, we don't really want to challenge those complexities. Indeed, we feel that those complexities are necessary for our our own wholesomeness. So we can become very defensive and very sensitive about these complexities. Of course, to others we like to present ourselves that, look, I just want to know the facts. I'm just concerned with as it is. We were all once children, so <laughs> we got it. <laughs> we like to present ourselves that, look, just give me the facts, just give me the straight scoop, that's the way I'm at. That's where I'm at, that's how I am. So let me ask you, if we did a quick survey here, how many of you would say, yes, that's me, I'm a fact-loving person, just give me reality. Raise your hand. How many would say, yeah, okay. Okay. And how many would say, well, <laughs> I don't know about that. Raise your hand. <laughs> Sometimes the truth is scary, isn't it? <laughs> so again, you can see that the majority of you all, you didn't want just the straight facts. Uh, you, in other words, what you're saying is a little bit of uh, not knowing, a little bit of uh, ignorance, you know, what you don't know won't hurt you, and you do need to have some blinders over your eyes to make it through the day and night. Okay? Because if you start thinking too deeply, that's scary. Or if it's not scary, it ruins the fun, you know. Right? <laughs> Do you really want to think deeply about everything all day long? It doesn't sound very uh, pleasurable, does it? It's nice to be in La La Land some other day, not all the day. Let's start with the day. It's just nice to have your own little world and we can imagine that everything is fine and so we're not making any value judgments about this tendency at this point. Social psychologists have long understood this and they have classified our creative self-deception into three categories. Number one, in relation to how you perceive yourself. 
Number two, in terms of how you perceive your relations, your friends, your peers. And number three, how you perceive the world. So, it may shock you to hear this, but when it comes to our own self-perception, generally human beings see themselves in a much better light than others will see. <laughs> and generally, I, I understand that you all here are special and you're different, but for most persons, they see their peers as less than them. <laughs> and they see themselves as more than what their own peers see them. This is a kind of universal human psychological tendency that some or other each individual feels, well, in my own way, I'm a bit better. <laughs> in my own way. And in their own way, my peers are a bit lesser. <laughs> so, how is it that we... Hmm, how is it that we see ourselves in this way? It's something that social psychologists call uh, self-enhancement. Perhaps it might be necessary for survival, you know? You have to feel good about yourself. And even though you make mistakes and you do dumb things, still, you know, just to make it through the next day, you have to feel that basically you're all right. As many of you know, a popular pastime on the campus is getting wasted. And, <laughs> and then when you're wasted, you, you do things that later you can excuse yourself for, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I was so blind, I was so out of it, you know. I, I, you can't help, hold me responsible for what I did last weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so when you become uh, overly intoxicated, uh, it provides a special dimension for your behavior. And so then later, when you become sober, you can excuse whatever you did before. So this is another form of self-enhancement. Well, that, that wasn't really me. <laughs> I mean, generally, I never do things like that. <laughs> you know, I was just, you know, it was just a weekend of intoxication, you know. And I was speaking at the University of Manchester and uh, students like you all. And so I asked a question, which I guess they thought was pretty dumb. I said, well, tell me, what do you all do on a Friday night? <laughs> <laughs> they kind of looked at me, and they kind of, what planet are you from? <laughs> what do you mean, what, what do we do on a Friday night? <laughs> I said, you know, seriously, I mean, you know, I, I, I travel the world, I'm open to differences in different places, so here we are in Manchester, UK, what do you do on a Friday night? All right, if you really want to know, as if you don't know, <laughs> what do we do on a Friday night? We get totally wasted. <laughs> and so... These were the future doctors and lawyers and engineers of the world. Uh, <laughs> and I, I remember one girl, she was uh, doing her medical studies. So she told me, and you know what the funniest thing is? It's when you wake up Saturday afternoon and someone is next to you and you can't figure out how that person got there. <laughs> and then Monday you, you talk it over with your friends and it's just hilarious. <laughs> so I did some sociological research. I asked some questions like, well, uh, when you do come out of your stupor on Saturday afternoon, uh, don't you have a splitting headache and aren't you just totally hung over? I said, yes, that's true. But for those few hours on Friday night when we were flying, that makes it all worth it.
What do you think? <laughs> they were trying to get me to understand, to sympathize uh, with their view that, look, you know, uh, a little bit of blinding yourself is fine. You don't really want to go through the whole week dealing with reality. What's wrong with having a vent into a special dimension where you can just do whatever you want to do and then later excuse yourself while all the time feeling that you're a decent person. Isn't that great? What do you think? In other words, who can face reality seven days a week? The human psychology is not meant for that. They were trying to explain this to me. The human psychology needs to escape reality. And so, the Friday night ritual, and of course Saturday night also, uh, of getting wasted, allows you to deal with the rest of the week. So implicit in their statements uh, is the notion that no one can face the facts straight on, moment after moment, hour after hour. Some branches of psychology will agree with this, yes. Uh, you have to do this self-enhancement. Because if you start really thinking about the realities, you won't have the motivation to get out there and get all that you can get. So in order to be acquisitive, in order to be shall we say manipulative in a nice way, in order to be a go-getter, you have to kind of bewilder yourself a bit and put the blinders on. Now interestingly, I don't know if you've heard this before, the persons who have the most realistic view of themselves and the world are those who are depressed. Sure. They actually have a realistic view of the world and their place in the world but at the same time they're classified as depressed because they have no they, in other words they know too much <laughs> <laughs> and because their accurate perception of the world uh, because of that, they don't have the motivation to do anything. Therefore, they're classified as depressed. True. But it's not that their picture of the world is so much disputed. It's what the, the problem is that they have no... That picture of the world they have, because it's so glaringly accurate, prevents them from doing anything. <laughs> and that's the problem. So therefore, in dealing with persons with depression, you've got to motivate it to do something. Mm. But it's interesting that in psychology, the re realism of depressed persons is not contested. But the problem is they don't do anything. Now, how is it possible to have a realistic perception of the self and the world and do something? This is what Bhakti Yoga is about. Those of you who have read Bhagavad Gita, the classic yoga text, you may remember Krishna explaining, I'll say it in Sanskrit, Dukkalayam Shastra. This temporary material world is a miserable place. So some people would react to that statement, like, oh, this is very negative. This is some kind of uh, Indian fatalistic. Outlook. No. Krishna is giving a realistic appraisal of how the material world works. At the same time, Krishna is offering positive steps for your extricating yourself from such. A place of suffering. 
If you look at the teachings of Buddha, Buddha said, I've come to teach two things and two things only. What is dukkha, misery, and how to become free from dukkha, misery. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna takes things a step further. Yes, the intelligent person should see the f basic inherent flaws of material existence. Those inherent flaws are, in Sanskrit, Janma, Ritu, Jara, Vyadi, birth, death, disease, and old age. So Krishna explains. Janma Mitchu Jara Vyaji Dukkha Doshana Darshana. The intelligent person sees the fault in material existence. Now, upon seeing the fault, that doesn't mean you become inactive and full of lethargy. You see the fault, and therefore you change your mode of interaction with the world. So, Bhakti Yoga is all about action. It's the yoga of action. That's why those of you who have read Bhagavad Gita note that it's spoken on a battlefield in between two armies. You couldn't think of a more active place. Mm. So here you have Krishna giving a realistic appraisal of material existence. And at the same time, Krishna is giving you an action program for how to make the best use of the temporary material world, which is a place full of birth, death, disease, and old age. How to capitalize on the temporariness of the so-called happiness, the temporariness of the body and the mind, the temporariness of relationships, how to capitalize on all that, even though it's temporary, so that you achieve something that is beyond creation and annihilation. So that is the objective of Bhagavad Gita. So in other words, on the material platform, self-deception is, is honored. It's just a question of how much self-deception should be in your life. In other words, if there's too much self-deception in your life, you're considered mentally ill. But if there's a legitimate amount of self-deception in your life, then you are considered normal. And if there's no self-deception in your life, then people don't know what to say about you. <laughs> You're considered freakish. In other words, from the conventional point of view, everyone needs some illusion in their life. A little dab will do you just fine. <laughs> you should embrace illusion number one about yourself that you are the body and mind even though intuitively most of you will say that I, I'm, I'm spiritual you feel that you're a spiritual being intuitively in terms of the, how we've been educated and how we mold our lifestyles it's all about being the body and mind we express ourselves through the body and mind and we want our happiness and pleasure to come to us through the body and mind according to the yoga text this is illusion it's the same thing as thinking you are your shirt you are your jumper. In fact, Krishna gives that very example in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. You change bodies just like you change clothes. You never think that you are the clothes. So why would you think you are the body? And from the viewpoint of Bhagavad Gita, the mind is also a body. It's a subtle body. So there's no question of mind over matter. Mind is actually a subtle version of matter. Mm. Now, just think for a moment. How upsetting it may appear to be to go through your day and night as if you're not the body and mind. What, do you, what else do you do? 
How do you have any pleasure? How do you have any good times if you don't act like you're the body and mind? People want gratification for their body. They want gratification for the mind. If there's no hope for any kind of mental gratification, you basically commit suicide. There may be no options for your body, but at least in your mind, you have to be able to imagine a better dimension, a better realm that you can access in your mind. Otherwise, if everything is so mentally bleak, you commit suicide. What do we do once we understand that we're not the body and mind, that we are a non-material identity? The science of bhakti yoga introduces you to the spiritual sensory activities of the spirit soul. In other words, it's not that when you become spiritual, you become inactive. No. The activities of the spiritual being are our normal behavior. But we have forgotten. It's like someone's hit you over the head and you, you, you become groggy to the point of being unconscious. In that way, we've forgotten about our original spiritual activities, how our senses function spiritually. We're lost in a dream world thinking, I am this body, I am this mind. So the preliminary purpose of the yoga system is to wake us up from this dream. But how many people do you see who really want to wake up? What's the proof these days that very few persons want to wake up? How many persons do you know who are interested in what is a good life? What constitutes a good life? Not many. The assumption is already there. Life is for getting money and life is for pleasing my senses. How many question whether that is the good life? No. There's already that axiomatic assumption. What do I want? I want money. I want mm -hmm. good times. I want food for my senses. Does that constitute the good life? How many classes at your university are all about let us analyze what is the good life not a very popular subject these days <laughs> <laughs> the assumption is there that look you're alive the world's out there get your share at least <laughs> you get more than your share then give a little bit to your friends and persons you like <laughs> but it's out there for you to get if you don't get it someone else is going to get it you might as well get it and the worst thing that can happen to you is how many of you played musical chairs when you were kids you remember that horrible feeling when the music stopped and you didn't have a chair remember that how awkward you felt it's agony for a kid. <laughs> you play musical chairs? <laughs> and remember, sometimes you were so embarrassed, you would try to squeeze onto a chair with another kid, right? Because <laughs> you couldn't tolerate the thought of not having a chair. Everyone else is, is seated and not you. <laughs> and everyone... And everyone's watching, oh, you don't have a chair. <laughs> right? You were trying to squeeze on with someone else. <laughs> so, the adults, as the children mature into adults, they keep that same consciousness. <laughs> Scarcity consciousness. I've got to always be on guard. When the music stops, I've got to have a chair. <laughs> right? <laughs> And you never know when the music's going to stop. <laughs> so 
You always have to be careful. Where's the chair? And if you're fortunate to have a reserved seat, then you try to help out your friends. Try to help out those you like. Make sure that they may be able to have a chair too. But always make sure you have your chair. So this is what society instills in us, this scarcity consciousness. That there's never enough in the world, and whatever little you have, someone is trying to take it from you. So watch out. Whether it's partners, you gotta keep an eye on your partner these days. <laughs> you just don't know. <laughs> there's, you know <laughs> there's no taboos these days, right? <laughs> True love today and tomorrow it's something else. You always have to be on, on guard. Keep an eye on your partner, your job. You don't know. You could be downsized any moment. Your money, its value fluctuates so radically. You just don't know what's for sure these days. And so this scarcity consciousness makes you very defensive, always on guard. Well, who has then the consciousness to try to understand what is life really meant for? What is the good life? We're too busy trying to fend off attacks and increase our holdings. Now just think how you'd be perceived in whatever social realm you inhabit, at the university or at the workplace. How would you be perceived you had well, nothing to nothing to boast about you feel very awkward people would not understand how to relate to you like, what do you have <laughs> what 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 is there about you that you know shows that you are secure in your chair for when the music stops you're not doing that but what are you about? What makes you tick? What have you grabbed? What have you gotten for yourself? You see, in order to help others, you first have to get for yourself, right? If you, if you haven't gotten for yourself first, then you're useless for anyone else. So the foundation for helping others is first to get for yourself. This is how we justify. Well, someone who seems not to be in an acquisitive uh, mentality, who doesn't seem to be achievement oriented as achievement is conventionally known, people feel they feel very uncomfortable around such a person. But what are you doing with yourself? What are you about? Get something. Do something. I remember when I was about fourteen. My father, he, he was expressing himself uh, in a way that you know, he wanted to relate to his oldest son, and I appreciated that, but uh, we were very different. Uh, I was very uh, inquisitive about what is the meaning of life, and he was... Uh, a monthly subscriber to Playboy magazine, and his uh, his guide was Hugh Hefner. <laughs> so we were different. <laughs> so anyway, he said to me one day, sat down next to me, "Son, let's talk. What do you think the meaning of life is?" So I was just 14, I said, well, well, Dad, uh, I don't know. I haven't worked it out yet. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what the meaning of life is, my boy. The meaning of life is to leave some tracks in the sand when you're gone. That's the meaning of life. Do something 
so that people will remember the tracks that you left in the sand after you're gone. So I thought about it for a few minutes, and I said, well, you know, I would be concerned, not so much about the tracks that you left, but I would like to know, where do you go when you're gone? Son, son, that's not the point, that's not the point. Think about the tracks in the sand. <laughs> I said, but really, uh, where do you go when you're gone? That is not the point. Just think, do something so people remember you after, you after you're gone. I said, but no, I'd like to know what's going and where does it go, whatever is going. <laughs> so we had our disagreement that way. <laughs> So then he proceeded. He saw that he wasn't getting anywhere on this room. So he then decided to, to give me some philosophy from his monthly magazine. <laughs> there was, in that monthly magazine, uh, I don't know, the Playboy magazine, I guess it doesn't come out anymore. <laughs> he pretends not to be. I thought I'd get that one by you. <laughs> so they had a monthly column called the Playboy Advisor. <laughs> and that would give all sorts of advice, which I guess these days would consider routine. But, you know, back in the 60s, you know, that would be considered, you know, uh, really cutting edge hedonism. <laughs> so, he told you, son, you know, you're 14. There's a lot of young girls out there. <laughs> Don't feel shy to get your share. <laughs> so I said, well, Dad, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 I wonder, what's the point of all that? You know, what's the point of that activity? Uh, oh, son, you know, life is not a spectator sport. you got to get out of the field and get it. <laughs> Don't just observe. You watch too many persons. You're just watching all the time. I used to just study persons. And sometimes I, you know, I would even ask them, why are you doing what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> I was eight years old. I would see uh, like a cup, couples holding hands. And I'd ask, well, why are you together? And they would just smile and say to me, you'll find out soon. <laughs> 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 so... My father, uh, uh, I, 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 according to his worldview, he was imparting good advice. You know, you're 14, you've got senses. There's girls out there, they're meant for gratifying your senses, you know. Don't feel hesitant. Don't be a spectator. Just get into it. And then what amazed me <laughs> was in the same breath, practically, he said, and by the way, you know, about your, about your 12 year old sister. If you ever see any boys walking home from school with her, you immediately let me know. I said, I said wait a minute, this is a quick mathematical calculation. <laughs> Something's not gonna work yet. If all the boys are encouraged to, you know, <laughs> proliferate, <laughs> and all the girls are supposed to be chaste and uh, uh, uncooperative, something's gotta give here. So I, I asked him, I said, wait a minute, you know. On the one hand, you're urging me to go out and, you know, sow wild seeds. On the other hand, you're saying, you know, <laughs> if I ever see anyone coming home, you know, you know, with my sister, I should let you know. He said, well, son, you don't understand. A daughter is a special thing in a father's life. <laughs> so he had his take on life. And I appreciated that he was trying to show some uh, affection. But I, I, was just, I just was very suspicious that, that is this the whole goal of life, simply to get your share and more of sense gratification? Now, perhaps you all would say, well, not everyone is that... Uh, grasping. <laughs> Everyone's not that uh, clutching at things. But, you know, there's like 
a very energetic way of going about getting your share, and there's a very courteous way of doing the same thing. But the bottom line is pretty much the same, isn't it? Whether you're courteous or whether you're just abrasive and pushy, you've got to, you know, look out for yourself and get what's good for you. And in order to do that, you have to have a bit of creative self-deception. Meaning, I don't know who I am, I don't know what, why I'm in this world, I don't know where I've come from or where I'm going, but I've got to have that chair for when the music stops. The pressure is on us. And then how do we defend ourselves? Look, it's the resignation tactic. Look, I didn't make the world like this. What do you want out of me? I'm just trying to cope. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just resign myself to that this is the way it is and I'm just trying to make the best of the situation, make the best use of a bad bargain. What do you want out of me, you know? I didn't make the world like this. That way we can offload any responsibility for our, uh, for our approach. So what I'd like you to think about tonight is why do we automatically assume that it's more constructive and also more pleasurable to put ourselves in illusion to some degree? Not complete illusion so that we're classified as mentally ill, but constructive illusion, positive illusion. Yeah, well, you know, I don't know what I am and you don't know what you are, but you know, so what? You know? <laughs> We're achieving things, we're making money, we're partying, we're, we're, we're traveling, you know. <laughs> and the world will facilitate such self-enhancement. The psychological terminology is self-enhancement. Yeah. Feel good about yourself, feel good about your future, even though you don't know what is your identity, why you're here in this world, what is your purpose. You can be happy without thinking about those things. You don't need to have the answers to those questions. Why trouble yourself about those things? The big questions which, you know, have been going on for millennia. Instead of troubling yourself about those issues, there's things you could be doing for your senses. Things you could be grasping, clutching, interacting with. You become alive in that way when your senses connect with sense objects. Otherwise, just to live a contemplative lifestyle of pondering the big questions. Where is the juice in that? So what the bhakti yoga texts contest is about what is the good life. Until we actually can taste the spiritual pleasure, it's very difficult for us to let go of the inferior temporary material pleasure. It's very difficult. We're so hardwired to get it to grasp, to clutch, to acquire, to achieve. It's impossible just to drop that. Even if we, through deep analysis, have understood that that kind of lifestyle is artificial. Still, you can't give it up. Maybe some of you here have tried. Through your fine intelligence, you may have concluded, look, this is just a repetition of the same old, same thing. Chewing that which has already been chewed. What is the point of all this? Grasping and clutching and achieving and pursuing. And <laughs> well, that's the point. So you can figure that out. You can penetrate the veil of positive illusion and start thinking that... I need to know exactly why I'm here and why and, and why I'm doing what I'm doing. I need to know that exactly. But 
unless we have a taste of positive spiritual enhancement, we won't be able to get, get out of illusion. We won't be able to drop the illusion. That illusion is too powerful. We're so overwhelmed by it that even sometimes we can see it, but we can't get away from it. Because we have to get our taste from somewhere. Maybe you can remember situations when you had you had come to some realization that what is the purpose of all this of racing like a rat and just overwhelmed with bodily and mental desires? Uh, what's the point of all that? But you couldn't take it. You couldn't take things further from that point because. Well, I need something positive to do. I, can, I just can't sit in my room all day and think, oh, the world's just an illusion. Uh, trying to gratify your senses just gives temporary, shallow, insignificant happiness. You just can't sit and do nothing. You need to have an active program. But what is an active program that's not part of the illusion? This is the great mystery of Bhagavad Gita. How to act in such a way that even by using your temporary body with its temporary senses, you can achieve what is beyond the temporary. You make use of what is temporary to, to achieve what has no beginning or end. This is Krishna's pleasure program in Bhagavad Gita. Many of you know that the precise meaning of the word yoga is connection, to link. So to link or to connect with what? The message of Bhagavad Gita is that we are tiny particles of spiritual consciousness and our natural life is linking with the Supreme Consciousness. Krishna means the Supreme Personality of Pleasure. The ultimate source has to have everything that you've experienced in your little world and unlimitedly more. But at least everything that you've experienced has to emanate from that ultimate source. So you have a desire for pleasure, even though you're so tiny. It's such a tiny particle of spiritual consciousness. You have that because you're part of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Pleasure. The ancient yoga texts describe that Krishna has desire. You have desire. But you, the spirit soul, are expressing your desires wrongly through matter, through the material body and mind. And therefore, so many problems overwhelm you. It's like someone expressing themselves in a nightmare. They're actually not absorb that nightmare, but they're dreaming that they are. So material existence is like a dream, and the purpose of the yoga system is to wake us up from that dream. We desire pleasure because we are part of the complete whole, the ultimate source, and that ultimate source is unlimited pleasure. You have a little bit of desire compared to the unlimited desires of Krishna. Now just think, how many desires can you have in your life? Think about all the things that you desire. Uh, Maybe five things come to your mind, not more than ten. (laughs) So although desire is so important for us, we can't really list without thinking about it, more than five desires. In other words, our desiring capacity is limited. What to speak of our capacity to fulfill our own desires? This is why we become frustrated and angry. We have a very (laughs) shaky time of fulfilling our desires. And this is why we feel so insecure 
And to compensate for that insecurity, we have to have the self-enhancement, the creative self-deception. Yeah, it's going to be all right. Yeah, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> it, it, it'll work out. <laughs> I think I'm going to be, I think I'm going to be happy in the future. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it'll be all right. <laughs> we'll be fine. <laughs> We have to compensate for our insecurities because we've been shortchanged so many times. If not in this lifetime, in many previous lifetimes. So the yoga texts explain that we're carrying a backlog of traumas from many lifetimes. So even though someone may not have hit a trauma in this particular lifetime that's devastated them, they're carrying a history with them. Because that's the way life is in material existence. So we desire, but we've had problems desiring. Krishna has unlimited desires. And simultaneously Krishna has the unlimited ability to fulfill every one of his unlimited desires. Therefore another name for Krishna is the Supreme Enjoyer. Supreme Personality of Pleasure, the Supreme Enjoyer. Infallible in enjoyment. We have a little bit of desire and we struggle so intensely to fulfill those few desires. And Krishna has unlimited desires and is 100% successful in achieving all his desires without the slightest bit of impediment. So the yoga system is meant to combine these two. The tiny spiritual particle of consciousness known as us and the supreme personality of pleasure, the unlimited consciousness known as Krishna. When the two get together, then <laughs> we can achieve the full status of our desiring capacity without any problem. But as long as we seek to fulfill our desires through matter in material existence, we go through enormous traumas, enormous setbacks, and therefore we have to deceive ourselves. It's going to be alright. I am going to get my share of gratification and a bit more and when I get a bit more I'll share it with others because that's what they want and this way we'll make the world a better place at least for a short time what else can you do and this way we resign ourselves again what else can you do hey I didn't make the world like this but we don't want to think about these things all the time you want to make merry and feel that some or other our senses will be gratified. Some or other will achieve physical and mental gratification. Looking at the facts of the situation, however, is not miserable. Because once we understand and will accept the basic proposition that material life is a hollow promise, then we can be motivated to go to a higher platform. In other words, once you realize that material life is hollow, insubstantial, it doesn't mean you're just going to uh, be negative and nasty. Uh, no. You go to a higher level. And that's what Krishna is inducing us to do in Bhagavad Gita. Not by just living a life of self-denial. Uh, everything is miserable, everything is temporary, everything is false. It's these. Uh, you can't live like that. You need something positive. You need to, to be able to invest in something. N none of you want to be alone. You want someone, at least one person around you whom you can invest in. And they can invest in you. Right? So what is the positive investment of our life in, on the spiritual platform? 
But Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita that when you get the higher spiritual taste, you'll automatically let go of the illusion. You won't have to indulge anymore in creative self-deception. You'll be able to face the world for what it is without being depressed because you have a superior program of superior pleasure. So that's what the Bhakti Yoga system is offering. Connect with the ultimate source, with the supreme personality of pleasure, and then you'll be genuinely positive. You won't simply be putting yourself in positive illusion, but you'll be genuinely positive on the spiritual platform. On the material platform, you have to cheat yourself. You have to delude yourself. And you're always feeling that paranoia that we discussed. Will I have a chair when the music stops? To get out of that consciousness, uh, we need to go to a higher level. As Albert Einstein once said, a problem is never solved on its own level. We have to go a step up at least. So that's what Krishna is inviting us to do in Bhagavad Gita. Take a step up. Go. Don't be afraid. Take your life up another notch and work things out on that higher level. That's much more beneficial for you than creative self-deception. So this is the great contribution of Bhagavad Gita and Bhakti Yoga and I hope that you all will in some way take advantage of it. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. Um, specifically coming back to your topic about people suffering and misery. Mm -hmm. yeah, let's say you're that person that had some sort of trauma in your life. How do you do the self illusion then? You don't even have the opposite illusion. Some of your words seem to no, depressed persons, according to psychologists, depressed persons see the world as it is to such an extent that they have no motivation to do anything, but they actually see the world as it is. I was shocked to hear that. <laughs> they see it, well, they see that <laughs> it's a problematic place. And what would you advise me to someone? <laughs> That's what I've been doing tonight. I'm saying connect with the Supreme Positive. You want pleasure. Why? <laughs> you have the desire for pleasure because you are part of a Supreme Reality that also has the desire for pleasure. But you're trying to have pleasure on your own. Like the hand that's amputated from the body Yet the hand is still trying to function on its own. It doesn't. It doesn't work. You're part of something. So yoga means linkage, connection. Once you understand that you are part of the complete whole, then you'll act in harmony with the complete whole, and in that way, your desires will be positively fulfilled. But if you consider yourself an autonomous unit, it's just me, and I got to get for me whether you do it in a, an abrasive way or a very courteous way. <laughs> I'm sure you, you might remember moments in your life when you went about getting for you in a very courteous, genteel way. As compared to the ruffians. <laughs> but still, the bottom line is the same. I gotta get for me. This is the psychology of an amputated limb that doesn't understand its connection to the ultimate source. So the real purpose of the yoga system, uh, beyond the asanas and the breathing exercises, the real purpose of the yoga system is to reconnect you with the ultimate source so that your desires are in harmony with the desires of Krishna. Otherwise, on your own, what can you do? If you perceive yourself as some autonomous unit, then you have to go for the creative self-deception. Uh, I think I'm pretty good. I mean, 
<laughs> yeah. Things are gonna look good for me. Yeah. My peers, they don't really understand my full value. <laughs> and of course, I do have a realistic appraisal of my peers. They are just a cut below me. <laughs> I explained, this is called self-enhancement. Everyone does it. it <laughs> Let's try for a different way of being. That's Krishna's invitation in Bhagavad Gita. Try for a different way of being. It can be done. Because you're motivated by pleasure. If you get higher pleasure, you'll let go of the lower pleasures. The so-called pleasures of self-deception can't match the reality of spiritual pleasures in connection with Krishna. We are watching Other questions? That was a thank you. Yes. I have a question. It's not so much a question, but just something more strong with basically because I was, you said that obviously material life is of a lot of but we are we are here now. I mean we have to face the facts. And yes, resign ourselves, yes. Even 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 here, like spiritual like um realization. I'm thinking of my work every day, I have pieces to write and I have mm. pictures to plan and it's something that I can't get away yeah. from it. But just to get that balance between okay, so what are the material things that you have to cut away mm. and what are the things that you have to use to enhance Oh very good question. That's a big question and a very good one. What are the things that you have to push away? Those are the negative activities that deplete your access to higher consciousness. We can consider some of them. Uh, participating in the web of animal slaughter, for example, dulls your consciousness. It uh, makes it very difficult for you to develop higher sentiments when you're unnecessarily participating in uh, a web of violence Human beings don't need to slaughter animals in order to live a healthy life. So if you do that, the yoga text explain, your consciousness becomes dull. You, you literally uh, make yourself uh, unconscious. You blunt the gift of higher human consciousness that you have due to such a negative activity. Another one, intoxication. The yoga texts explain that we're already intoxicated enough just by our identifying with the body and mind as the self. We don't need any more intoxication. <laughs> Another negative activity. Uh, how shall we put it? Um, casual sensual interactions. <laughs> how was that? <laughs> whether the hookup is, you know, wild university party style or whether it's done in a more uh, refined way, still a hookup is a hookup. <laughs> so. If you're not the body and mind, then by indulging in such activities, you're simply increasing your, the depths of your illusion. And you want to go the opposite way. You, you want to decrease the illusion, not increase it. So, for example, uh, real love is not about physical interaction, biological interaction. Real love is about being partners in enlightenment. Let us work together to come out of the darkness into the light. That's real love. Not let's, you know, let's just... <laughs> Reminds you of something that Nobel Prize winning philosopher Albert Camus said. 
Don't try to lead me. Don't try to follow me. Just walk together with me through the chaos. What do you think? How's that sound? <laughs> if someone said that to you, you'd say, yeah. <laughs> okay. Huh? Sounds attractive? <laughs> In other words, life has no meaning. Just generate your own meaning. I'm not going to try to lead you. You're not going to try to lead me. Let's just, you know... Enjoy our senses as we walk in the chaos. <laughs> yeah. Well, what would you? What would you? What would you? How would you respond? Well, I. If, if someone made that overture to you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd like. Uh, I'm thinking in terms of what my companion walks in the chaos, but not in terms of. Well, what, what's he supposed to do? Let's help each other just get through it. Get through to where? To Oh, that's different. Uh, so you, so yes, that's intelligence. So you, so you like that? Yes, dude. a partner in enlightenment. Not just there's nothing. There's no meaning. There's no no ultimate goal. So let's just make our way through the chaos and enjoy ourselves along the way and who knows what's going to happen. <laughs> why, why even worry about it? You know the, uh, the Greek mythology. Who was the person who was condemned to push a stone boulder up to the top of... Yes, Sissy. Yes. Uh, every time he got the stone boulder to the top of the hill, it would roll back down on the same side. And so that was his whole life. Just pushing the stone boulder up to the top of the hill. And when it got to the apex, uh, the zenith, then it would uh, go right back down to the bottom again. So, what do you do about that? Well, since that's all there is to life, just find your own, just find meaning in the struggle. Even though it's pointless. Your freedom is that you can create your own meaning of the struggle. What do you think? <laughs> she says no. <laughs> so you can imagine someone saying to you, look, you know, together we'll just push that stone boulder up to the top, even though it's going to come right back down again. But we'll, we'll build our own world around this. <laughs> we'll make our reality whatever we want as we push the stone boulder up and it comes back down. And we're free to make of this situation what we like in, in terms of how we see it. Which, how would you respond to that invitation? <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Can one ignore external uh, influences in your search for this perfect happiness. What I mean by what I mean by external influences in, in, in the environment you live in, in in, a, in, in, the, in like the political influences in a, in a country, or, or the social influences in, in, in the town where you live, or the social influences like at university. You know, this I think one can mention a lot of influences on in your search. But can one ignore that in your search for perfect happiness? Hmm. <clears throat> it's not a question of ignoring them. It's a question of being on a higher level. And actually, if you really want to make change in this world, you have to go to a higher level. There have been so many attempts since time immemorial to sort things out on the political platform the social platform. And you make a little, little progress here, a little bit of progress there, and then things revert, or there's a new permutation, a new combination that, that, that and you realize, all that effort, not much was gained. So this goes on and on and on and on. The intelligent person understands that you have to take your game to another level. And on that level, you can actually enact meaningful change and transformation. But on the material platform, you always get 
promissory fulfillment. You get a promise. Oh, this is going to be better. And and for a while, it looks like indeed things have marginally become better. But then some other permutation happens, some other twist in the road, and oh, you realize oh, we're back to square one again. <laughs> so this is world history. So it's not a question of ignoring it. It's a question of going to another level. So no matter what the material situation is, you can still be effective in terms of yourself and for helping others. So this is what Krishna wants in Bhagavad Gita. That's why Krishna speaks Bhagavad Gita on a battlefield. He's talking to Arjuna, who's a military man. Now how is Arjuna going to uh, ignore the battlefield <laughs> the fact that he, you know, he's in an impending battle? No, Krishna doesn't advise him, just ignore it all. Krishna is going to teach him how to go to a higher level amidst such a crisis situation. So we need persons who will take their game to a higher level. And then they'll know how to handle any situation. So-called good, so-called bad. Good, good economy, bad economy. Good politics, bad politics. <laughs> the history of the world is such that it's up, down, and all around. Again, again, and again. Meanwhile, time is taking its toll. <laughs> so the best solution is to go to a higher level. And that way you can actually help yourself and help others. We just don't want to be stoics, you know, just tolerate what's around us. It's all illusion. <laughs> They're all deceiving themselves. <laughs> Positive illusion, creative self deception. <laughs> That's not what I'm advocating. I'm advocating be aware of such illusions and the propensity of human beings to have positive illusions in order to make it through the day and night. But learn how to function on a higher level. That is the wisdom of bhakti yoga. How to connect all of your practical activities with the ultimate source. Just as Arjuna did it uh, in his role as a military person, similarly you can also do it as a student, as a family person, as a business person. As, this is the great art of how do you use the temporary for the sake of achieving the eternal. So we just don't want you to you know, grit your teeth and bear it. <laughs> we want you to become a transformer. <laughs> Be the change, as often is said. Be the change that you want to see in the world. Anything else? Yes. Can you just ask me about um, two things that we have to go to a higher level? Yes. And we have to connect. Yes. Can I say that going to the higher level means that we're doing the position and then the connection is actually with the content? What, what exactly do you mean by surrender to Krishna? It means that um, we don't think what is best to do. Just consider this child here peacefully asleep. The child is actually surrendered. The child feels secure. The child's not feeling threatened. So why don't we think of surrender in that way? Like a child who is convinced that he or she has good parents. 
and that the parents will take care of the child. Otherwise, we sometimes can put ourselves into a tense frame of mind, surrender to the supreme. <laughs> like it sounds like you, sometimes I, I see persons perceive that as like you know, being mugged on the street. You surrender all your money, <laughs> surrender your wallet, surrender your purse. But rather than that perception, think of just a, a child. Let's say this child's head was on the mother's lap. The child is surrendering. Everything is fine. You know, the little child's not. You don't see a four-year-old child with a good parent worrying, uh, is the mortgage being paid? Uh, <laughs> is there food in the refrigerator? <laughs> the child surrendered. <laughs> but uh, it's not like uh, you're being mugged. You know, surrender your money. So when Krishna in Bhagavad Gita says, surrender to me, it's with the attitude of unlimited love inviting you uh, as they say in Australia I'm based four or five months a year in Australia New Zealand, the famous Aussie saying no worries mate <laughs> not a problem <laughs> that's what Krishna means by surrender you harmonize with the complete whole because you're a part of the complete whole why be a rebel? Why act like an amputated hand? <laughs> Reconnect. Yes, and as you say, the yoga texts advise in this dense age of darkness, the prime method of reconnection is chanting Hare Krishna. That's the prescription, prescribed medicine. So I just wanted to elucidate on that point you nicely brought up about surrender. But it sounds, I know this, yeah, it sounds a little intimidating. <laughs> to some you have but if we consider how this child is surrendered to the mother or father uh, oh well, that's natural uh, the parents should be good they should take care of the child the child should feel no anxieties so that's all Krishna is asking for <laughs> but we are so defensive <laughs> What is this a talk about connecting to the Supreme? What am I going to lose? I've got a lot of good things going for me, you know. I've had some good times. It may be illusion, but... Uh, <laughs> it was good illusion. <laughs> okay, it was all temporary, but anyway, for a few moments I felt good. But <laughs> Other questions? Yes. What do you call a turn for the worse? Like materially. Like, uh, like what? Like more environmental degradation of this kind of thing. Well, it's not a, a uh, arguable notion anymore that there will be a f effects of climate change felt. That's <laughs> The question is how much? That's, that's the only thing. <laughs> how much is avoidable and how much is unavoidable, but there will be some kicks. What, what else do you consider it to be? Uh... Uh, like maybe, I imagine it would be good if maybe this idea that you're not just a material body can enter the world and the academic world. There is, I've noticed, because I keep track of publications, there is, in the US and the UK, in the past three years, a, a, an emergence of books by academics who are saying materialism doesn't make sense. It, and it, now they say it doesn't mean that we um, embrace a spiritual conception, but we have to be honest and say the materialist doctrine has no basis. The, they're agnostics, but they say we want to be honest. There's no proof that consciousness is produced by the brain. There's no 
material solution to the problem of what is consciousness and how did it originate? So we just want to admit that, rather than embrace a materialist doctrine that says everything is matter, everything has a physical explanation. So they're brilliantly uh, tearing apart the physicalist approach. I always like to quote someone who's arguably the most famous scientist in the world amongst laypersons, Stephen Hawking. Yes. Just face it, we're simply chemical scum on a moderate-sized planet. <laughs> now, how, how many of you feel comfortable just, I'm just chemical scum? <laughs> <laughs> You, you can just imagine, you know, uh, hooking up with someone. Excuse me, chemical scum. Uh, <laughs> let's get together. <laughs> yeah, let's scum it up together. <laughs> no, you, 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 intuitively, you can't handle that. So there, ha there has been an upsurge in literature protesting what is called scientism. The theology that, uh, which says that current science has it all figured out. <laughs> There's a market ups, ups, upsurge in that kind of literature by agnostics. They're not embracing a spiritual conclusion, but they're just saying, hey, look, let's just be honest. The physicalist doctrine doesn't have it all figured out in the least. So, that could be the beginning of something. What do I predict? <laughs> well, I travel on every habitable continent of the world. That means everywhere except Antarctica. Uh, I see that people are have their backs against the wall in terms of they don't see any viable political or economic solution. There's a great crisis in institutions, economic and political institutions. They're not delivering anymore. The problems of the world are so interlocked and so interdisciplinary. Uh, those problems dwarf the institutional capacities that we have. Economic and political institutions, they're dwarfed by the, the, the scope of the problems, the interconnectedness of the problems. Now, institutional problem actually means a human problem because <laughs> the institutions are created by human beings. So they can't come up with anything. There have been no new political ideologies for ages. <laughs> no new economic, no new major economic ideologies. What to do? So I see this in my travels throughout the world. Leading thinkers sometimes say, well, maybe we should all just run our countries like China. You know, they, they're making a lot of money. I guess that, you know, that's the goal of life. So uh, <laughs> what's the point in having, all, having democratic freedoms if you don't have money? <laughs> You may have the right to vote, but you don't have money. So maybe just better forget the right to vote and get a little more money. <laughs> so you see an institutional crisis throughout the world. <clears throat> the environmental problems, the economic problems, energy problems, <clears throat> resource problems. Uh, they're so, they, these problems are so great, they transcend national boundaries. They transcend our institutions, economic, political institutions. What can one politician with four years or so in office do about it? <laughs> so what I see is a growing frustration and helplessness that our institutions can't handle the immense scope of problems. So it's a good time for thinking persons and we hope that you all will play a part in thinking deeply and taking your game to another level.
Anything else? Yes. <clears throat> so, I mean, I, I read the book by Krishnamurti a few years ago, and he had a lot of lectures in America. And the whole book was all about his lectures because he never, he never used to comment on anything, he only just played lectures, as you probably know. And there was just one phrase in the book that, that stood out for me, and it was this. He said, if you want to change the world, you've got to first change yourself. What do you think about that? Yes, that is a, a good statement, but then we have to know what is the self. And we have to give a clear idea what is the self and what is the self part of. Otherwise, yes, everyone says, you know, be the change that you want to see. And everyone says like that, but they don't have the knowledge of the self. They don't understand what the self is part of. So Krishna is giving that information in Bhagavad Gita. So this person you're mentioning, they're pointing perhaps in the right direction, but we need to actually get a delivery of the goods, the wisdom. What is the self in relation to the Supreme Self? That is what yoga is all about. Connection between the individual particle, spiritual consciousness, and the Supreme Consciousness. And the relationship between the two. <coughs> then you'll see an actual transformation. The hand on its own cannot transform itself when it's amputated. It's got to reconnect, and then the hand functions properly. So we need to reconnect to the complete whole. That's what Krishna is inviting us to do in Bhagavad Gita. How are we doing for time? I love talking to you. Okay, any other questions? I really like coming to Cape Town, my favorite place in South Africa. <laughs> There's one, there's one, there's one, there was a, a Dalai Lama who was being interviewed, excuse me, by a reporter on that. And the reporter asked him what his definition of happiness was. And you know what the Dalai Lama said? Contentment. And that's such a, it's such a, a, a beautiful, just one word, contentment. And from a spiritual point of view, that's, I think it's, as long as we think we are matter, we cannot be content. So there are different levels. Just like in school, there's nursery school, there's kindergarten, and so on and so forth. As we progress through the various levels of spiritual understanding, we sooner or later have to come to the point of realizing as long as I think I am matter, there is no actual contentment. So we have to change our paradigm. And that's what Krishna is speaking about in Bhagavad Gita. You're not matter. This is the first lesson in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2. You're not matter. You're not the body. You're not the mind. So why are you seeking satisfaction on the bodily and mental plane when you're not that? You have to go to a higher plane. Listen to me. Connect with me. I'll open up a completely different realm of behavior for you. So I thank you all for your kind attention. Hare Krishna. Like, uh, I, I like 
or I tried to do it myself, but um, I was wondering for our preaching programs, especially our uh, BYS here at UCT, because mm. it's kind of been just maintained, but not increased. Yeah, that used to be my favorite things. program at UCT. Mm. Yeah. That used to be my favorite. So I, I like it myself, and also the Saturday night, mm -hmm. which is Spirit Matters, which is this one. Mm -hmm. And because um, I was wondering if you could give any pointers on it. Uh, just, just be their friend, and be their friend, and you'll, your own style will develop. Mm -hmm. Just be their friend and be compassionate. Uh, don't debate with them, just encourage them and try to gradually get them to take up Christian consciousness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because I guess also it goes to beyond the program, but how you interact with them beyond just the program. Like, well, where else do you see them besides the program? Um, well, there might be some friends, like four or five people that uh -huh. they come sometimes, or they become more than just the program. Though, and then they say, um, actually, the one person uh, said that, uh, like, so what do you do for fun? Like, can you go to the beach or the woods? Like I said, yeah, we do kirtan, we can take reside. He said, yeah, then we should go to the mountains. Great. And then uh, <laughs> yeah, you should do that. <laughs> yeah. Good. Yes, you should. Normal people do that. <laughs> yes, UCT, is well, I, I always like going there. Krishna, Krishna.